My instrument panel has seen a lot of changes lately. First, the Avidyne IFDs, which are a great upgrade over the old GNS 530 and 430 they replaced, and now a digital engine monitor from JPI, the EDM 930, which can legally replace the old mechanical engine gauges. Look at this clean panel. The mechanics, Gene and Mike, have done a fantastic job with the metalwork for the overlay panel, painted in matte black to match the avionics stack to the right. In the previous video, we followed along on the installation. Now the time has come to test the new unit. Today we're going to power up the new engine monitor, do a run up and, if all looks good, take it for its first flight. And at the end of this video, we'll take a look at what could be the next avionics upgrade for my Bonanza. Alright, coming in. Battery on. <laughs> This fuel pressure. Fuel pressure is probably oh, what you'll fuel use. pressure is what we're, what we're using. So once the yep. fuel pressure peaks, we'll start priming. Yep. And then where's my oil pressure next to it? So we want to see that one rise after we crank. Yep. Prime. There you go. Good. Clear. All right. So we got RPM indication, which, which looks good. We got uh, manifold pressure looks good okay we got oil pressure which looks good we got uh, EGTs which are low but rising is the alternator on yet now it is uh, now so we I get a charge I, I do have it backwards then yeah I can switch that I bet that should show a charge now right yep you would think good and we got matching displays here for the red and the So we noticed the ammeter is connected the wrong way around. It shows a charge when there really is a discharge on the battery and vice versa. That'll be easily fixed by swapping a couple of wires. Everything else looks as expected. After the run up, we do a thorough inspection of the engine compartment looking for anything loose any, or wet. Any uh, fittings we change that touch fluid, we're just checking for leaks, things like that. Normal uh, run up inspection after maintenance. I already looked at the fuel flow transducer down there. It's dry. We did have these lines cracked, so I'm just checking them for drips. This is the fuel pressure line. Everything looks good there. And uh, I think I'm just going to go ahead and swap the two ammeter connectors and have a look at that while okay. we've got it open. Yeah. Um, and then we can go for a flight. Then it's time to restart and take off. After all, we didn't go through all the trouble just to sit on the ground, right? I'm not used to having to wait for this to be on before I can see the fuel pressure. Oh yeah. Okay, fuel pressure. Taxi Northwest Tees with information Papa. Full length, please. Mr. 7 0 Tango Bravo, Cedar Epistron, 49er, taxi via Alpha. 49er, taxi via Alpha, Bonanza Steel Tango Bravo. Every time I see a uh, center line and I'm not completely on it, I hear Doug Rosendahl's voice. <laughs> he said uh, center line is a lonely place, it's for professionals only. Oh, yeah. We'll turn it into what little wind there is for the run-up. Sounds good. Fuel is on the left tank, that is the fullest tank. And uh, confirmed visually, I can see fuel in the left tank. Excellent. Uh, brakes are set, flight controls. Free and correct. Max. Prop. And uh, ammeter 
oil pressure, oil temperature, all good. I have to get used to where all that stuff is. Departure briefing, we're departing runway niner, Cedar Rapids, full length, long runway, plenty of options, any engine anomaly, anything we don't like on the new display, keep an eye with me please on the, the temperatures and pressures here on the takeoff roll. Yep. Uh, we stop straight ahead. Any Anything under 2000 MSL, we will look for a place straight ahead to land if we need to. Um, if we have an engine anomaly afterwards, taking off towards the east today, we can make a right turn and land on runway 31. Perfect. Um, and then we'll go from there. Sounds good. Any questions? I think I'm good. All right. Cedar Tower, hello, Bonanza 70 Tango Bravo, ready for departure, runway 9 -er. Bonanza 70 Tango Bravo, Cedar Rapids Tower, good morning, turn left heading 070, runway 9 -er, clear for takeoff. Left heading 070, clear for takeoff, runway 9 -er, Bonanza 70 Tango Bravo. Now we're clear this way. And clear on the runway, King Ears on Alpha. A little bit of fresh air in here, as soon yeah. as we can. Sounds good. Okay, take off. A little over 2700 RPM. Temperature and pressure good. Yep. Everything looks good. SP is live. Positive rate. And likes to yell at you for going over 27, doesn't it? Yeah. Sea Drive departure, good afternoon. Bonanza 70 Tango Bravo, 1500. Bonanza 70 Tango Bravo, Sea Drive departure, radar contact, turn left on course. Left on course, Bonanza 70 Tango Bravo. Cherokee Zero Kilo Papa, contact tower 118.7, keep your speed up, I got traffic to follow this, appreciate it. Roger that, we'll keep it up over the tower. Engine is performing just like it, like it normally does. Okay, yeah, all the lines are pretty much straight across, that's awesome. DHTs are where I would expect them for a day like today. You didn't have a fuel pressure in PSI before, correct? Correct. I, I, just had, still had, fields, but I had fuel pressure going into the yeah, just flow gauge, for a, uh, I didn't departure. really measure pressure, I don't okay. think the EDM 800 had anything equivalent. Okay. I was just thinking for comparison's sake, but... And we seem to be burning off the right tank Probably now, 35, so it's... 2500. 2500, Low fuel. I think oh, in the turn we... Starting to dip into the yellow there, that must be low fuel. And I'm going 3584, clear visual approach, you're only a niner. And a visual niner, I'm going 3584. Very smooth flying airplane. Yeah. You want the Yogan? Oh no, thank you. So far I think I'm liking what I see. Everything's yeah. looking normal to me. Let's set the uh, brightness. That's very easy to do. A lot of times it's uh, kind of a convoluted <laughs> layer of menus to do that kind of thing. Bonanza 0 Tango Bravo, talking to my turbulence, regional dead on 3 mile final, contact tower 118.7. Bonanza 7 Tango Bravo, regional dead inside, uh, contact tower 118.7. Bonanza, uh, have a good day. Sea Travis Tower, good afternoon. Bonanza 7. Zero Tango Bravo, it's on the left base, runway 9 or uh, regional jet on final is in sight. Then some zero Tango Bravo, Cedar Rapids Tower, runway 9 clear to land, on your way turbulence. Runway 9 clear to land, Bonanza 7, zero Tango Bravo. Gas, undercarriage, mixture, prop.
nicely done. Bonanza 0 Tango Bravo, stay parking. Uh, west ramp, Bonanza 0 Tango Bravo. Bonanza 0 Tango Bravo, turn left at Alpha 3 to parking, straight ahead, my frequency. Left at Alpha 3 to parking, your frequency, Bonanza 0 Tango Bravo, thanks for help, have a good day. Everything worked out great on this test flight. But one thing we hadn't done yet is the calibration of the fuel tank indicators. Here's what that means. The fuel system varies quite a bit from aircraft to aircraft. In my case, the 1978 Bonanza has four fuel level senders, two in each tank connected in series. Each pair of senders has an electrical connection to the JPI, and the JPI reads that as a numeric value for that tank, a number. The higher the number, the higher the fuel level is. However, these numbers do not directly represent gallons, and an empty tank isn't necessarily reported as zero. Therefore, a calibration process is needed. Think of it as teaching the JPI how to convert the numbers from the fuel senders into gallons of fuel for the display. We start with an empty tank, with unusable fuel only, and make a note of what number the JPI sees. Then fill up by a quarter tank at a time and note the numeric readout on the JPI each time. This gives us five data points. Empty tank, one fourth, one half, three fourth, and full tank. Here you see how I did that for the left tank. With an empty tank, I start the JPI in a special mode to show the numeric tank level readouts. I made myself this little table here on the clipboard. And uh, what it does here is has for the uh, left tank and the right tank numbers. I already completed it for the right tank. But for the left tank, we're doing that tonight. Um, numbers, numerical readouts from the fuel sensor with the tank empty, you know, nothing but unusable fuel in it, all the way to full in quarter increments. And we're going to call the fuel truck soon, but first let's take the reading for zero. The way to do that is to hold the fourth button in while powering up the EDM. And it gives me a reading for the left main of 180. So I'm going to write that down here, 180 when the left tank is empty. Then I asked the fueler to add 9 and a quarter gallons, which is one fourth of the 37 gallons of the usable fuel in this tank, according to the POH. Okay, then we can go to 18.5. We continue to half and then three quarters. Okay, next is 27.7. Finally, I ask him to top off the tank. And then top it off, please. And here you can see we put 40.6 gallons of fuel into this tank, a bit more than the book value. Okay, I gotta figure out what the value is now for the last. That is 1850. Okay, now we got these values here. And I gotta program them into the device. And I did that already for the right side. We'll do it for the left side today. I've written down all the numbers on a sheet of paper and I start the EDM 930 in a special programming mode where I can enter all the recorded values. It's a bit hard to do that with a user interface which only has four buttons, but it works. And it's not something I expect to repeat anytime soon. In the end, all the values are programmed and the fuel calibration is complete. Of course, this upgrade isn't officially done until the paperwork is taken care of. That includes a logbook entry and Form 337 to the FAA, as well as a weight and balance update. It's not a huge difference in weight, a reduction of less than three pounds in this case, but I'll take any savings I can get and the associated increase in useful load. 
So what did this upgrade accomplish, other than create a cleaner, more modern look? There are many little improvements. One I can easily show you here is the improved lean find function. You can see the EGT is rising here as I lean. The JPI identifies and marks cylinder number 3 as the leanest. That's the first one to cross over peak EGT. And cylinder number 5 as the richest, the last one to cross EGT. Then it shows me degrees lean of peak as I lean further, referencing cylinder number 5. Everything you want to know when leaning is right here on the display. After the engine monitor and Aberdyne IFD installation, the center and right half of my panel looks pretty good, pretty modern. The left half, not so much. It's the six pack, the traditional six pack with steam gauges. They work, but before too long, it'll be time for an upgrade. So I wanted to get an idea of what's out there. And I looked in particular at solutions from Aspen and Dynan. In Oshkosh, I was able to talk to both vendors. Michael Schofield is Director of Marketing at Dynan and he walked me through the Skyview system. So we're here at Oshkosh Air Venture 2019, uh, one week after the announcement that we have approval for almost 600 piston single aircraft uh, for our Skyview HDX system. That includes our entire Skyview HDX system, including primary flight displays, engine monitoring, autopilot for some models, transponder with mode S uh, uh, capability and ADS-B out, 2020 compliant, AD ADS-B in traffic and weather on the moving map, comm radio, basically the entire uh, suite of uh, Dynon equipment. For the A36, which I know you have, we are currently working on autopilot uh, approval right now. In fact, our test mule is right outside the, the booth. It's going back to Dynon uh, tomorrow or tonight and uh, over the coming months we will finish up the approval for that and then the A36 will join the uh, V35 P through uh, 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 B series with autopilot uh, installation. We have solutions that start under $10,000 for our base two screen system that includes your primary flight instruments, backup flight instruments and a VFR moving map. So our autopilot is a full two or three axis actually in the Bonanza installation. So we do have a yaw damper uh, for the V-tail models, especially the, uh, the tail wag is, is absolutely removed. We are a comprehensive autopilot. If you connect our system to an IFR navigator, we can couple approaches. We can uh, shoot LPV or glide slopes. And then we really do have any mode you can think of. So in addition to uh, the yaw damper I mentioned, uh, we have a full flight director. So even if you don't engage the servos, you can follow the guidance that the autopilot gives you. Um, on the, the horizontal or lateral modes, we can follow heading or ground track, which is the same thing as heading except it corrects for wind. So if you want to fly north, you just dial your bug to 360. And the airplane will fly north uh, you know, disregarding uh, the heading. We can fly nav mode, which means anything that the HSI is, is displaying. So that could be our own flight planning on, from our own moving map. That can be any of your IFR flight planning or approaches that are coming in from your, GP, uh, your IFR GPS navcom. And then on lateral, mo uh, or, sorry, on vertical modes, on pitch, we can do altitude hold. Uh, but then in addition to that, I can pre-select a new altitude and then engage vertical speed mode. And so now, for example, we, we're at 3,700 feet. I've just asked for 5,200 feet at 500 feet per minute, and that's reflected up here in the autopilot status bar. We can also, uh, this is especially useful for climbing out if you want to climb at, let's say, VY to, to get to altitude uh, optimally, or if you want to fly uh, something uh, a little higher than that for engine cooling, we have airspeed hold mode. So if, uh, we know that our best, you know, that the climb that we that we want to achieve is uh, at let's say 110 knots. We can just set the bug to uh, 110 knots, and the airplane will hold that. The autopilot also has uh, many envelope protections, so it respects G limits. It won't pull, you know, pull the airplane too hard. It uh, has bank angle limits, which are configurable, and it has um, airspeed limits. So even if, let's say, you, you set your altitude bug to beyond the service ceiling, at some point you're going to hit a minimum airspeed that the autopilot won't fly below. So it'll just sit there in that slow regime, not, it's not going to stall the airplane. Same thing for descents. If you ask for, uh, let's say, a 4,000 foot per minute descent, and that would put you into, into your VNE range, there's a high airspeed limit that it will obey as well. The base system is 
the flight instruments, the map, and the backup flight instruments. The engine instruments is an add-on. It's inexpensive. It's only $1,600 to $2,000 depending on the airplane model. So I can quickly pretend that we have you know, not purchased the engine monitor and turn this into just a PFD and we can make that full screen for example. Um, we, we have some interesting info items. We could uh, quickly turn that off as well. So you can display uh, a full PFD. Um, the way I usually fly is I'll use half the screen as map. You know, this is a touch screen map. If I'm just going for a hamburger and not flying IFR, you know, we just can pull up an airport, get our information about it, you know, comm radios, then direct to, and now we're off and, and we're, we're on our way to, uh, to get some lunch. Mm -hmm. When do you see the certification coming for the A36? So I think our official uh, date is the second half of the year. So mm -hmm. it is, it's really going home, finishing up the autopilot, and then doing our flight testing. So it's going to be in the coming months. I also asked Michael to talk about the installation effort of the Dynon system. You have to re uh, remember that we came up providing avionics for over 20,000 home-built aircraft. And most home builders have never built an airplane before. Most home built, uh, their aircraft is the first time they've uh, built an aircraft. And it's often the first time they've done things like complex wiring. So what we've learned over the years is the more help we can provide the builder, the better. And what that means is that we have full prefabricated harnesses for practically all of the interconnects. So, you know, you still need to wire up your engine probes, you know, wire to probe, but a lot of the modules, we have harnesses that are available in multiple sizes for, for your aircraft. <laughs> That those are also available in the PMA, in the approved version, for in our install shops or people that are installing mm -hmm. our Dynon certified okay. systems. So we've designed this to uh, to be as as easy to install as possible. We have a mounting tray. These are some of the modules. This is the airing module for uh, so that connects to um, your IFR navigators. This is the Adahar, so you've got your pitot static. And there's an angle of attack connection. This has all of your um, the attitude sensing instruments as well. This is the engine monitoring module, so you have a couple of harnesses that go to your different probes. ADSB in for traffic and weather in the cockpit. Um, in the certified version, you'll, you'll always have a backup battery for each display and a backup battery that's inside of our EFIS D10A, that's the small 4-inch display. And then over on the left here, uh, this is a, you know, what we call our Skyview network hub. So all of our, we have a, a, what we call Skyview network, which is a dual redundant data and power bus to connect many of the modules. Mm -hmm. So you'll see there, everything's kind of daisy chained together. Uh, so even if you had, let's say, a, a wire, you know, that's passing through the fuselage that, that ends up getting uh, cut by a, a piece of aluminum, as the data wires start to get cut, it will say, oh, something's happening. Uh, you don't have redundancy anymore, but everything's going to keep working. So that's one nice advantage of the Skyview network. These cables- So I get an advance warning that something's broken, but it doesn't feel right away. Exactly. Uh, all of those connect into this uh, Skyview network hub, which really just creates more of those ports. And then uh, to the left here, we have our comm radio and our transponder. Uh, the transponder is a remote unit, which is controlled from by on-screen controls. Mm -hmm. And the comm radio does have a, 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 a head that is, uh, a control panel that is yeah. on, the, on the panel. But I assume it will work with my Lynx transponder also for ADS-B? Yeah, or? so for people that have already, you know, if, if you don't have a, a 2020 uh, compliance solution, it makes uh, the most financial sense. You'll, it's most affordable if you use our transponder and ADS-B in and out solution. If you already have, uh, let's say, the links are one of the, the many options for ADSB out, you can keep that. You would, the only thing you would still use if you wanted traffic and weather on our system is we have an ADSB in module. So, so you don't take that from an existing exa exactly. ADSB so that comes from our own okay. receiver. But uh, as long as you have an ADSB out, a uh, compliant ADSB out uh, a product on board, you'll still get your full traffic and weather mm -hmm. portrait. And here's Scott Smith, director of sales at Aspen Avionics. He showed me the Aspen Evolution system in detail in Oshkosh. Hello, my name is Scott Smith. I'm with Aspen Avionics and I'm going to go through our new 2500 system today. So what we're offering is uh, a, either you can do two tubes or three tubes. Two tubes would be called the three, uh, 2000 system and the three tubes is a 2500 system. Both of these uh, offerings would have an external battery and what this allows us to do is remove all backups. So literally you could cut a new panel, put either two screens in or three, and no backups are required. So we'll go through this. What, what allows us to do that is we have internal uh, backup AHARs built in to the system. So you've got dual AHARs, uh, dual batteries. This one actually has an external battery that uh, lasts about two hours of use. So you've got full redundant system. One operates independently of the other. Now, as far as 
UI, user interface, and functionality, we can, we're very open architecture. So we can tie in to uh, everything from the old NAV, uh, like a KX170B, all the way up to the new uh, Garmin, Avidine uh, navigators. So we're uh, very open, uh, we call it open architecture out there. We also interface with a lot of uh, uh, general aviation autopilots. And we do everything from the Centuries, the Kings, uh, STEX, and uh, the new uh, uh, True Track and Trio autopilots as well. So it uh, gives you a lot of options um, when you're looking for uh, new avionics upgrades. But as far as what, uh, what you're seeing here, you've got two MFDs and one PFD, multi-function display, multi-function display, and primary flight display. The primary flight display is gonna stay primary. Think of this like your, your six pack. You've got your airspeed, attitude, and our attitude indicator, what I really like about it is we give you a line every two and a half degrees instead of every five. So it's very precise. And, it, and there's a lot of movement at first, but once you get used to it, you, you realize how precise it is and, it's, and it's, it makes it really nice and smooth, smooth for, the, for the flight. The uh, altimeter is, uh, you, you have an altitude alerter and then your altimeter's right here. We have uh, air data information here. So we've got true air speed, ground speed, wind direction, and speed. Now we output that data to your navigator. So if you have a Garmin, an Avidine, or uh, even a, like the CNX-80, we'll output the air data information and the navigator uses that to calculate all your turns uh, for turn anticipation. It also uses it to draw your holding patterns and procedure turns. So it likes to make them like egg shaped, which is pretty cool. Um, and we got all with lots of different layouts. One of the best features Aspen has is that we're very customizable. And you can do different layouts on all different screens because everybody's brain works differently, right? I may like this certain layout and another, uh, you know, the, the pilot next to me will, might like something different like this, you know, or something like this. And I, and I really enjoy how simple they are to operate. And I know it looks like there's a lot going on here, but from, from a, just a, a quick overview of how easy they are to operate, You've got the left knob, changes the, the layouts. You've got full screen, split screen, and thumbnails. And any of the layouts you're on to change that what's in the window, you turn the other knob. And that gives you the options for what is available inside that window. You push in on the knob, it's gonna bring the selector over to the other window and it cycles through. So I can change what's in those different windows that, that easily. And as I'm going through, I have the options right here for what I can do to change the layout of that particular, whatever's, whatever that window is on or what that window is controlling. So it's really intuitive, easy to run. After you know a few hours of use, it's, uh, it, flows, it flows pretty good. So uh, what I like, for instance, like taking off and landing, I'll put uh, terrain on one screen, traffic on the other. So for the first, uh, I don't know, 10 or 20 miles, when I first take off, I like this layout so I can see if I'm under anything or anybody. And then I still have my moving map right here for situational awareness. Once I get in the air, I can, I can bring up, once I get up and get away, I'll, I'll uh, bring this, this map like to a north up and see where I'm at, where I'm going. I can look at the weather between, uh, between uh, me and the uh, destination. And I'll still leave this one in a, in, a, in a smaller zoom scale just so I can see what's relative it's right around me. The uh, so just to give you a, a quick overview here, uh, like I said, airspeed altimeter, air data information right here. This is without synthetic vision turned on, and then we also overlay your flight plan here. And we'll and we'll if you want to clutter it up a lot, you can do that as well. And over th overlay things like airports, nearest VORs. We'll put traffic on here next rad. And then uh, you have uh, your source selector here. Now, if you have it tied to a new uh, navigator, it automatically switches between GPS and VLO. So, like if I have, uh, say, uh, the Avidine 440 or uh, 540 or 550, or the new Garmin products, anything from a 430 up to the latest, their latest products, it automatically switches from like GPS to VLO when you're shooting an ILS approach. And, and I'm sure it has all nice. slews, so I don't need to set my course pointer manually. Correct, so it automatically sets the course for you, um, and that's really nice when you're you know, shooting an approach or you're going down a flight plan or you're following an airway or whatever, it automatically sets that course for you. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, uh, a, a couple other things I want to point out that are nice on the screen. 
let's say we're shooting the approach. The cool thing about our we new, hit minimums. Uh, this is actually on the minimums the here, the we dial in whatever the minimums are on the and approach plate, do, right? So I'm going to simulate it, and as we're as we're coming down, you get a chevron right here. You're 500 foot for minimums, and as we're coming down and, uh, on the glide slope, I'll show you glide slope. This glide slope, glide slope localizer. As you're coming down, you get another chevron when you're 100 foot for minimums, and then a red and yellow chevron at minimums. So when you're 100 foot for minimums, it comes up and says approaching minimums through your headset, and when you hit minimums, it says minimums in your uh, in the headset. So it makes it very obvious that you that you've hit minimums. So when you're shooting the approach, everything you need is from about right here up. So if you look right here, from if you drew a line across the screen, about right here up. Everything you need for the approach, from the final approach fix and this approach point's right here. So we really don't, you know, the scan kind of goes away and your focus is right here. You've got your airspeed, you've got attitude, you've got glide slope, localizer, minimums, what altitude am I going to, of course my altimeter, what the winds are doing to me, what my heading is, and what my track across the ground is. Mm -hmm. So all that information, that per information is right there in front of you, and it, it makes it one of the best things I like about our product line is um, how easy it makes shooting approaches. Can it share a database for terrain and nav data with the IFDs I already have? Are there, are there bundles for that, or do, is that a whole separate subscription, or how does that work? It's an additional subscription if if it's if, if you choose. There's no requirement for that. Um, but if you want to add the subscriptions on to your existing subscription with Jepson, that's a, that's an a, it, it, so in other words, you don't have to buy it all over again. It's there's usually uh, depending on what you have, what service plan you have, um, there would be a, di a discounted rate for that. Mm -hmm. A couple other things I'll point out when we're do when you you have a heading bug here. So when you're selecting a heading yeah, and, or selecting be, uh, anything, notice so how the font size pops up and gets larger. Like so and, and I'm just pushing it on the knob to change it. So, so my heading bug's here, and also we give this little breadcrumb trail coming out to the heading so bug. So it makes it easy to identify where my heading bug is. If I hold in on it for a couple seconds, it's going to sync up to my current heading. And it just makes it easy to identify where you're heading. So if I push in on it, it jumps up here to my altitude alerter. And depending on the autopilot you have, we can we can offer uh, altitude pre-select, um, and we have some really nice interfaces like with the uh, DSC 90 autopilots and the uh, STEC 55X. Currently, we're working on adding the new digital autopilots, the uh, Garmin GFC 600, as well as the um, STEC uh, 3100. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, I have an older Century 3. I understand right. that's a more limited. Well, so on a, with a Century 3, uh, Century 4, any of the uh, the older legacy autopilots, uh, we will still give you an option for altitude pre-select where it's an additional $1,500, but you can add a, uh, another box, that's so a little remote mounted box, and an arm switch on the panel. And so whatever altitude you dial in on the Aspen, you hit the arm switch, and it and then basically I call it poor man's altitude pre-select. It's you know, $1,500, and when you get about 20 feet away from the altitude, it kicks in altitude hold for you. Oh, so there, there is that option for the Century 3 even? Yep. Awesome. Yep, so there's that. Um, and we've been we've been around uh, selling these since 2000 and actually delivering them since 2008. We got about 15,000 systems out there flying. Um, we're gonna take good care of you. We're a retrofit company. Uh, we're based out of Albuquerque, New Mexico. We build them right there. And uh, I've been wearing this shirt for, uh, I guess going on 12 years. Um, and we, all of us are pilots and We'll, uh, we'll take good care of you. Whichever system I choose, it'll be a while before I make this move. And there's a lot still to learn and discover with the new upgrades I just got. I'll work some of those discoveries into future videos here on this channel, so please subscribe and like this video if you found it interesting. Thank you for watching, fly safe, and see you soon in the next video.